the symptoms of this border problem are so massive and they fall into every other aspect when it comes to safety. We obviously have people coming in who are known criminals. I want to topple the cartels. I don't want to even have people know what the word fentanyl means in the future. You're a woman. You know Donald Trump very well. I, I believe his policies are actually very pro-woman. When you look at um, just wanting to make sure that we have secure streets, he wants to protect girls' sports. My goodness, how many of us competed at some point in athletics? And I'm glad I didn't have to compete against men in athletics because that's just not a level playing field. I think the issue they try to drive a wedge between us is on abortion. President Trump is not going to pass a national abortion ban. What I do believe he is going to do is work hard, and I want to help shepherd this as well, to put forth policy that does support women. I want to make sure that no woman is forced to make a decision like that based on just sheer economics, saying I can't afford to take care of a baby. I was pleased to read that you're a Midwestern girl. Yeah, I, I grew up in Iowa. Where are you from? So I was born in Wisconsin, technically, in Beloit, Wisconsin, but we lived in Illinois, just north of Rockford. And you were born in Rock Island, right? I was born in Rock Island, yeah. Which is like 90 minutes, I feel like. Maybe yeah. it's not. It's like very close. I've been through Rockford a million times in my life, you know, every time we were heading toward uh, Milwaukee to visit family because I have family in Wisconsin. My parents are from Wisconsin. And I lived in Iowa my whole life. The only reason I was born in Illinois is because I, I grew up on a, a Mississippi River town on the Iowa side. And my mom, who was Catholic, wanted to make sure we were all born at the Catholic hospital, which happened to be across the river. So drove across the river, had the babies and brought them back home to Iowa. Kind of similar. I mean, I was only born in Wisconsin because it was the closest hospital. Like I was, <laughs> I lived in right. lived in South Floyd, Illinois, but grew up uh, was born in Beloit, Wisconsin. So, just a proximity thing, being a border girl. I can sense the Midwestern um, in you, which is a compliment because it's always. Uh, I think people from the Midwest just have an ability to relate to others um, in a way that's very unique to that region. Why do you think that is? Because I, I, you know, when you you usually know when you've met a Midwesterner whether it's like Wisconsin or Illinois or Michigan or Iowa or something like that, you, you Indiana, why do you think that is? I, I just think it's a comfort level that there's there's a comfort level that Midwesterners have with other people and they make people feel comfortable around them. It's kind of like that. <laughs> I think of the Beach Boys song, the Midwest farmers' daughters really make you feel all right. No, you know, yeah. and and we do. We I think just being a Midwesterner, we're we're comfortable with each other. We talk to each other. We're friendly. And that shows, and you can even spot it when you think someone's from another state, like they go, oh, I live in California, or I'm from, um, you know, North Carolina, and you're like, oh, I, I pegged you for being Midwest, and they, <laughs> then they go, oh, but both of my parents were Midwest. So why did you land in Arizona then? I ended up um, coming here to become a broadcast journalist uh, at the local TV station. Uh, I was working in my hometown. I got the call that they wanted me to come out and interview. And I came out and interviewed in 1994. In August of 94, I drove into town. It was 113 degrees. I opened up the car and a parking lot, you know, asphalt parking lot, opened up the car, got blasted with that furnace heat. I stepped out and I said, I love this. And I knew right then I'd found my home because I love the heat. I love everything about Arizona. And um, I just felt felt blessed. I got a dream job to work in telling the stories of, of the people and covering the issues of Arizona. And uh, I loved that job forever. I'm mean, Being from a family of nine back home, we had to work for everything. We didn't have any money. We were poor, but nobody ever told us we were poor. We thought it was normal to have to work for literally everything. If we wanted shampoo and toothpaste and 80s. I grew up in the 80s. Hairspray. We wanted hairspray to keep our hair up. We had to pay for it. And so that meant we had to work. And I had that great work ethic. Came out here and um, kind of honed it even more as a journalist. And it was really until COVID that I realized that I lifted my nose from the grindstone for the first time in my life and recognized that the industry, uh, my, my industry of journalism had died and it had become replaced with propaganda. And I was horrified to, with that realization that we were pushing things that weren't the full truth. And there was no more um, desire to get to the bottom of things. To you know, COVID was just thrown on us. And they expected us to go, this is the new norm. And 
Now you're going to shut your business down and you're going to wear a mask and you're going to put a mask on your two-year-old. Yes, she will have to do that. And dad, you got to get a shot if you want to keep that paycheck coming in to feed your family. And, and we're going to send your kids home from school and torture them with masks and take everything away from them. When that all happened and there was no curiosity or interest in the mainstream media, which I found myself part of the mainstream media, to dig around and say, wait a minute, let's push back against the government. The government's telling us to do this. Since when do we just uh, obey every single thing the government says, especially if it doesn't make sense? And during that time, I just recognized the mainstream media didn't want to push back. And so I didn't want to be part of that. And I walked away from my job. I was in the middle of a very lucrative seven-figure contract and I just walked away. I said, I, I don't want to be part of pushing propaganda on the people of this great state. I didn't realize when I did that, I put out a video to tell the people why I was leaving and explain to them that I, I felt journalism had died and I didn't want to be part of this propaganda. And I put the video out so they would know why I disappeared. And I didn't realize that that video would go viral. And when the video went viral overnight, that's when people started reaching out and saying, would you please run for office? We need somebody who we trust, who understands the issues facing our state, who understands us to run for office. And at first I kind of laughed. I thought, are you kidding me? I'm just getting out of the corrupt world of mainstream media and they want me to go into the even more corrupt world of politics. <laughs> No. Oh my but God. But then it, it became, you know, how sometimes when one person says something to you, it makes you think, and then another person says the same thing. A few days later, more people are saying the same exact thing. And it was just a steady stream of people saying that. And I thought maybe and this is God kind of tapping me on the shoulder. So we jumped into politics. Sometimes, first off, congratulations and the level of bravery and confidence that that takes to make that kind of huge transition and stand for what you believe in is exactly yeah. what this country needs. And I commend you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I didn't even realize it was a courageous, bold move. I'm going to be honest. I had, I thought that video I put out would just be seen by a few people in Arizona. And I did not realize that it would send a shockwave across, um, this country. I, I had many journalists reach out to me. I know, I know I've know, i become friends with two who saw that video and that was the impetus for them to say, I'm stepping away too. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to work for a paycheck that requires me to do something immoral, which would be a lying or pushing false narratives. I'm just not going to do it. I wish more people in the media would do that. I, I want to tell them it's not worth the paycheck to sell your soul for this kind of fraud and evil that's being per perpetra perpetrated on the American people. Because the masses are the voice, right? We are actually the power. Our cooperation is what gives someone else the strength to continue to try and tell us what to do. And imagine if, you know, workers within corporations and companies would have took a stand and said, in mass proportions, they would have said, look, we're not going to take this shot if that's what you want us to do to keep working. Like, I guarantee they would have kept those doors open and they would have found another way. And it's the revolt. It's the it's the rebellious revolt against absolutely wrong missions that people have that they want us to carry out. Um, we are the power. A lot of people did, though. I remember um, when I jumped into politics, protesting on street corners with airline workers who said, no, we're not going to do this. You're going to have to fight. You want to fire a whole bunch of pilots? You want to fire all your flight attendants? We're not doing this. I worked with first responders who were fighting. And, and a lot of people just said, I will walk away before I get be forced to take a shot I'm uncomfortable with. And listen, if you wanted to take the shot, great. But I think we should have had the right to make the choice for ourselves and our family, not had an employer force us to do it. So a lot of people did take the, you know, no one's getting through this time. This is a really unique time in human history that we're blessed to be a part of. And I say that because even though it's difficult, we're so blessed to be here for this moment in history. No one's getting through this unscathed. <laughs> It, what there's going to be alive. sacrifice. There's going to be sacrifice at some level for all of us. And we've all been forced to sacrifice and, and that's okay. We're, I believe we're chosen to be here at this moment by God. I really do. I, I don't think it's an accident that you've jumped into the movement, that the American people have stood up and said, no, we're not going to be forced. This, this government, the mandates won't be forced on us. We're standing up and we're going to fight for this great country. It, this is it. This is a country that God had a hand in in creating. I know that. 
And we're standing up right now to protect it because the world will not survive if America topples. Yeah. And that's why they pay such close attention. I obviously, I work with a lot of people from other countries and they're like, look, the United States is really the most important sort of government and country in the world. And what we do has ripple effects across the entire planet. And yeah. I, I think that, you know, when, when you were speaking about just to sort of highlight the hypocrisy and the crazy making, I feel like that the other side, I wish everyone could feel and see what we feel and see. But, yeah. you know, you're talking about, you know, mandates, vaccine mandates or whatever kind of rules that they wanted to implement that was affecting your body. Right. Even the fact that whatever you did was affecting me, not even whatever I did independently. And yet now they're the party that also on the other side, Captain Va Hypocrisies, says, no, my body, my choice. Everyone should be able to get an abortion if they want one at any point in time. Yeah. I find it to be such a wild time. I feel like I'm going crazy when I watch the narratives that they project versus what they actually do or what they end up doing. Or like an example, there's so much talk about upholding democracy from the other side and the least democratic thing that exists right now is that Kamala is running for president of the United States when she wasn't even elected. Like that literally goes against the fundamentals of democracy or her accusation of President Trump wanting to be able to use military force at his disposal. And, the, and then she turns around right afterwards and says, we're going to use military force if anyone contests the federal ruling on whatever happens in the election or if anyone protests what we say, it's like, I feel like I'm going crazy. I call it living on planet crazy because sometimes you just go another day on planet crazy with the hypocrisy at levels we've never seen. Um, accusations they make against us is actually oftentimes what they point at us. And I've always been told when you point at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at you. And usually what they're accusing us of is what they have been up to. I wake up every day, I go, what the heck's going to happen today? And I know we're all weary from it all. I'm encouraged, Danica, because I'm seeing a unity that I have never seen in my life. And I've been around a few years that's happening right now. People are turning off the mainstream media. They're lying to us, trying to say we're, we're divided 50-50. It's, oh, it's really tight. I think it's 80-20. I really believe 80% of this country is with us. This country, I know too many, I know more people in Arizona. I talk to more people in Arizona than anybody in the whole country. And I've been all over the country. Um, the people of this great country are not voting for their own demise. They're not. They realize what we have, and we're seeing this unification of the American people that's not Democrat versus Republican anymore. It's truly Americanism versus something much more sinister, I think, communism. So we're, we're making the choice now. Do we want to keep what it means to be America, or do we want to step into that door that's already open right now into communism? And the, I love that um, the women are standing up, the mama bears of the world are standing up. You know, when you get a bunch of moms who are so busy. And I remember having, when my kids were little, now they're 20 and 21. When, when your kids are little, you're so busy, you know, you, there's not enough hours in the day. You're checking homework. You're making sure they're fed. You're making sure the house is uh, in order, checking out their backpack and getting them off to school. The last thing you want to have to add to your to-do list is save the world. The moms are recognizing if, if we don't get involved, our children are not going to have a future. And I'm seeing this massive movement of mama bears, of moms who are just saying, we've got to get politically involved. Our campaign has a lot of moms on it. One of my favorite moms, Alicia, has two kids. She's not seeing him as much anymore because she's putting so much effort into this campaign. And she always says to me, my kids know what I'm fighting for. I'm fighting for their future. And it's worth it. I know that eventually the election will pass. I'll be able to get back to being with them nonstop. But this is just the next seven days are critical for everyone to get out and vote. Don't you have a mama bear initiative? I do. Yes. What is that? And it, well, it, it's a whole bunch of different policies that we need to push to make sure that uh, we don't have a future for our kids where they are living in a totalitarian world. They are living in a America, United States of America. It's a, it's a multi-point policy that talks about um, things like 
securing the border so that we have safe streets, funding our police so that our neighborhoods are safe, making sure parents have parental control over their family, that that we're not handing over and ceding control of our children to our schools. Um, you know, they're pushing things right now on our kids that I believe are uh, psychological abuse, whether it be from the indoctrination, pushing things like CRT, where they're telling our kids to judge somebody by the color of their skin. And most horrifyingly, this gender ideology that they're pushing in schools where they're taking kids who are just going through normal, normal issues that our kids go through as part of growing up and saying, oh, if you're having angst right now, it, it really probably means that you're in the wrong body, that God put you in the wrong body. And they're they're pushing for our boys to transition into being girls. And you know what I'm talking about. And these surgeries that they're, you know, my opponent wants to allow children to have sex change operations behind their parents' back. And uh, all of us have seen what those surgeries look like. We've seen as they've removed the breasts from our daughters, they've actually removed the um, perfectly healthy body parts from our our sons. They've they've mutilated young people. Can you imagine, Danica, back when you were, you know, when I was 18, 16, 15, decisions I was making were not decisions I'd want to have to hold for the rest of my life. That's why I'm just trying to figure things out. That's why we need responsible adults around us to help guide us, not adults around us to help push us into bad decisions that are irreversible. And um, and frankly, I think really should be criminal. Anybody who's pushing a child to have one of these sex change operations, it's just, um, it's it should be criminal. I think these doctors who are performing them should be held liable. And and really thrown behind bars. Why are why are you cutting off a perfectly healthy part of a child? It, it's it's it goes against what medicine should be. It's more of the crazy making. You just can't imagine that these full grown adults are able to carry out these things with with a with enough of a conscience to do it, because yeah. it is so wrong. If any any human being can look back to anything before they were probably really twenty five, and think. What was I doing? <laughs> I would never do that now. And the fact that a child is able to make a decision at five or eight or 10 or 15 even that would change the trajectory of their life. What's so sad is that these children that go through these procedures and go through these hormone blocking medications, they literally like won't be able to experience climax or pleasure or anything in the reproductive department for the rest of their life leading to sterilization and they won't have be able to have children and um and truly they will become forced to be in in uh, a, a state where they have to be tied to the medical establishment oh, forever, forever. Mm -hmm. because they're going to have health problems forever and there's a lot of money behind that which is a very sinister thought that that it's if that's what's really behind it covid same thing you know i just think i was just speaking to somebody that was talking about how they would i know this is an old story but i just hearing the numbers refresh to me eighteen thousand dollars a day for someone to stay on a ventilator is yeah. like you know the 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 driving force behind everything is follow the money and that's why I think that it's so beautiful that you've come from a unique background of television and having exposure and experience firsthand to the fake news, the media manipulation, the propaganda that gets put out there, and that you're not part of the conventional political machine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a powerful place to be in. And well, and they hate me for it because I call the media out. I, you know, much like President Trump, who woke us up to the fake news, I was working in the news and I didn't see it. I, I, I knew there was bias in the media, but it really wasn't until COVID where it was like, boom, an explosion of just pure propaganda that went out that was the light bulb moment for me. And I look forward to getting to Washington, D.C. and holding these people, these uh, corporate uh, CEOs who are running the the corporate conglomerate media accountable when did they know they were lying to the people who was pushing these lies on the people and you know we we give these fcc licenses and i've been saying this for years we give these fcc licenses to these uh, corporate media giants and they're lying to us. Why are we giving them these valuable FCC licenses? And I'm so glad President Trump is talking about this now and saying, why are we doing this? We're not going to give these FCC licenses, the most valuable thing out there when it comes to media, to these corporate giants who are 
committing fraud upon the people of this country with the lies they're telling. And look at just how they cover the candidates. And I just saw a, a study that President Trump's being covered you know, negatively like 95% of the time. When I ran for governor, that same group did the study and they looked at how Democrats were covered by the media and how Republicans, oh, yeah. and they, it was something like 89% of Republicans are just covered negatively. And then the last line of the study said, there was one candidate who had 100% negative coverage and it was yours truly. But I, I take it and I tell people this on the campaign trail, whoever the media is attacking the most and the loudest is who you need to get behind and vote for. That is the person that is the biggest threat to their corrupt system. And that's somebody like President Trump, like myself. Just watch what the media does, whoever they're attacking. And they're going to start attacking you, by the way, Danica, if they haven't already. Yeah. You, you yes, go from they, being like beloved and you are beloved and you are a trailblazer and a legend in in um, in racing. And, yeah. you know, uh, you know, to be a first is always a great thing. Then the minute you step out, they attack you. It's like a pack of angry dogs on you. And they do that to make an example. They attack me. They attack President Trump to scare people who are thinking of being bold and courageous. They, they attack someone like you and then they go, oh, I better not. Look how much Danica lost. Look how uh, that she went from being a, a darling of the media to despised by the media. It's not worth it. I will tell you, it is worth it. We're going to go down. The people who were willing to risk everything will go down as the heroes of this time. And I'm not doing this to go down as the hero. I'm doing it to help save our country. But the pain we feel today we will look back on and it will be, uh, it'll be actually a badge of honor. Mm, God, thank I you believe. for saying that. And well said. Speaking of, there are, there are so many people that are part of this. Well, this has been called the Avengers group, right? To be honest, you're one of them that is not part of the normal party, but whether it's Elon or Bobby or Tulsi or Tucker or Charlie or, you know, so many of the other brilliant minds that aren't necessarily part of the exact sort of group that might be in the White House or part of the transition team. But, you know, you get Grant Cardone, Patrick Bett David, Jordan Peterson, the most brilliant minds in our country and some on the planet are supporting Donald Trump. And it baffles me how that doesn't hit people harder. So who have you met within that? Because you're going to be in Washington, D.C. a lot. As yeah. being senator from Arizona, that's a huge part of your job, right? To be to be in Washington, D.C. So who have you met and talk about their personalities and just this group of people that have come together that also you also share that difference um, compared to so many where you your party has not always been consistent, whether you're a Republican or independent or Democrat or Republican. You know, that's an example. That is what's happening, too, within this group is that you're right. It's not Democrat versus Republican. I don't even know what that means anymore. This is uh -huh. good versus evil. This is right versus wrong. So talk about this group of people that have come together and the role that people could play in making this country greater than it's ever been. Well, I think I've met all of them except for Elon. So hopefully someday I'll get a chance okay, to me meet. Me too. He's one of the Elons I haven't met either. <laughs> but it's it's going to be one of those um, beautiful uh, convergences of of just American citizens. This is what it's supposed to be the the people of our country coming together to help save it. I I, I saw what happened in um, North Carolina and Tennessee, and and unfortunately with with the hurricane and the flooding. Um. Um, there was nothing left in the coffers from FEMA because of the irresponsibility and, and frankly, just despicable behavior. People like my opponent who actually wrote a letter to FEMA a couple of years ago and said, take all the money we've got and pour it into settling people here illegally. Yeah. I bring this up because uh, in all of that tragedy, we saw something so beautiful happening, which was American citizens stepping up and helping one another like we always do. But it was in, and it was in such a way that I get I get the chills, um, goosebumps thinking about it. They were uh, people who were survivors were coming in and trying to save lives. They were helping because we couldn't count on the government, and it was required us to come together, pull together as Americans, pull ourselves up with our from our bootstraps, help out a neighbor in need. And it was really some of the most beautiful um, signs of caring that I've ever seen in our country. And it's happening all over. It's happening in this movement of all of the the Avengers, as you called them. I love that coming together. President Trump 
doesn't want to bring in, like he did in the first term, a bunch of Washington insiders who are really compromised. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't know. He comes in as a bit as an outsider with a business background saying, why can't we get some things done here and solve some of these problems? And he kind of was stuck with who was around him. Right. And remember at that time, anybody who criticizes him for bringing the wrong people up around him, the media had made it so poisonous, the atmosphere, that outsiders didn't want to come in and be part of it. He would try to invite a CEO of a company into the White House back in 2017 to showcase what they were building. And the um, you know fake news media would attack that CEO, would try to destroy the company. It became where it was just so poisonous, nobody wanted to come up around the president and support him and be a part of it, that <laughs> he was kind of forced to pick from the drudges that were there. And the drudges were part of the corrupt uniparty. This yes. go around, he knows who's who. He knows who's been loyal to our country. He knows who wants to actually get in there and get the job done. I can't think of a better person than Elon Musk to go in and just tear out the waste in the government. This is a guy who bought Twitter and fired 80% of the people because they were doing nothing. And, and, and they were Twitter censoring got people. They were doing nothing and censoring people. Yeah. So I love this. I love this coalition of just great um, patriots who love our country. We all bring a different skill set, but right. what we all have in, in common is that we love this country and we want to save it. And it's a beautiful thing. I invite everybody out there. The, people are already coming into this movement, but I invite if you're a Democrat watching, if you're on the fence, if you're watching, this is a movement about restoring America to a level of greatness where we all are going to do better. Whether you, I, I always tell people, even a Democrat who's not voting for me, I'm rooting for them. I want their life to get better. I want the economy to get better so that they can afford to live a little bit easier so that the streets are safer. And I, I believe President Trump wants that as well. I've gotten to know him very well, and he is an incredible human being, so kind, so wonderful, so smart. And um, he's truly not in this for himself. I, I don't think he's got a huge ego. I think the media tries to portray that. He's happy giving credit to others where credit is due, which is why he's bringing all these people in. Well, you don't have to do what you're doing. You already had a good job. He doesn't have to do what he's doing. He already had a great job. From what I understand, according to some statistics I saw, he's the only president that has a lower net worth than any other president preceding him for many, many, many elections. The others have gained in wealth by tens of hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. So you, none of, neither of you and so many others have to do the job you're doing. You're doing it because you want to. And that is a very big difference between a career politician who's climbed the ladder. And this is like the peak of their career. This is how they, this is, this is also, I think, probably what they end up having to do. This is the system that puts them through, which is probably yeah. exactly why Kamala's in the position that she's in is because this is just how it goes for those people. That's why you can't ask what her policies are because she doesn't know. It doesn't matter. It's not her that's making all those decisions. You are the ones that are going to be doing something about it. So I'm curious, when you work in D.C., we're talking about you having already accomplished this win. Um, <laughs> what are some of those most important issues that you are going to bring to D.C. that you're going to bring forward from Arizona? Obviously, border is a huge issue in this yep. country. I saw some some numbers on just how much it costs each state with illegal immigration. And I don't know exactly, but I feel like it was almost maybe $5 billion, which is one of the highest amounts in Arizona versus so many of the other states. Will that be the top of the list? What will you do? And what are the other things that you're going to do in D.C.? We have a lot on top of the list because there's so many problems. The good news is as big as these problems are, the solutions are actually pretty simple. Build the wall, remain in Mexico, stop catch and release. And then we work to take all the millions who've poured over in the past three and a half, four years unvetted. And we work to take them and return them back to their loved ones in their homeland. And that's going to be a, a big job, but we're going to get busy doing that right away. Uh, I believe the border it has... Uh, the, the symptoms of this border problem are so massive and they fall into every other aspect when it comes to safety. We obviously have people coming in who are known criminals. That makes our streets less safe. So when we tackle the border crisis and 
return people back to their, uh, we repatriate them back to their homeland. We're going to take a lot of those people who are unsafe and get them off our streets. That's going to make our streets safer. When it comes to safety, we're going to be able to tackle the cartels. I want to topple the cartels. I don't want to ever even have people know what the word fentanyl means in the future, because we are going to stop the drug dealing, the drug cartels. It's destroying uh, our children, taking our children's lives. And look at the chronic street homelessness. That ties right into the open border as well. So many of these people living on the streets have gotten their hands on drugs. They are hooked on drugs. And if we shut that pipeline of dangerous drugs down, then we can finally help people who are homeless, chronically homeless on the streets. It's going to help um, our economy as well. We're competing with 20 million people who've been poured into this country in the past four years for housing. No wonder our housing prices have skyrocketed all over this country. And we're and for services and for jobs. My goodness, if you look at all the job growth that's gone to foreign-born workers, all the job losses have come at the at the hands of American-born workers. We got to flip that around. Somebody recently said, "Well, how are we going to fill all these jobs if we take the people who poured in recently and and send them back home?" I mean, I'd like to see Americans get some of these jobs. There's so many Americans who have just left the job, left the labor force because they just there's no job for them. So we're going to get people trained up to take the jobs that are out there. We may have to put a little a bit of money into training our young people to take some of these jobs. But I think Americans should have first dibs at the jobs, not somebody coming in illegally. Yeah. So border is a key issue because it affects so many other issues in our yeah. lives. But as a mother, I want to make sure that we are bringing education and education freedom back to our communities so that all of our tax dollars follow the student, not some failing school. And I believe once we do that, we'll bring the quality of our education up. Because if you are a public school and you're mad as heck because we're we're allowing the, the tax dollars to stay with the student, not just be forced into a public school, the best way to improve that public school is to have competition. And if all of a sudden at public schools watching as kids leave and parents pull them out and put them in a charter school or private school because they now have the freedom to do that, that public school is going to have to make some choices and say, okay, how do we adjust our curriculum so we're more attractive to families? How do we improve to make our school the best choice? And they're going to be forced to do that. And they are going to do that. And it's going to be incredible. We'll watch our public schools get better. Yeah. Right now, when all the money just gets funneled into the public school, they don't have to uh, yeah. make those choices. And we're going yeah. to take the, I, I really hope President Trump is serious about this. I want to get behind him. I want to get rid of the Department of Education. That was a uh, a heinous decision by Jimmy Carter, that they brought us that in 1979. And since then, our education system has gotten worse and worse. We don't need it. We should have the uh, education be all decided right there at the local level. So I want to work on that as well. And I want to work on water issues. I could go on forever, by the way, Danica, but we're living here in the West. And and you are an Arizona resident. We're one of our favorite residents here in Arizona. And we want to make sure that we have water. The West is an attractive place to live. Um, There's some really bad water policy right now, allowing a lot of water that we should be, um, you know, hanging on to and storing to just roll out into the Pacific Ocean in California and leaving us to fight for drops of water in the Colorado River. And we're all fighting for a drop of water here and a drop of water there. I do believe in water conservation, but we cannot conserve our way out of this. The West is growing so rapidly. And if we continue to give the short end of the stick to the ag community, because we keep pulling back water from them, them, we will have a food shortage before we have a water shortage. I want to work with President Trump to do some really bold things when it comes to water for the West and work with our Western states to look at ways of piping fresh water in. We pipe oil and gas and other things around this country. There's not a darn reason we can't pipe water (laughs) from from freshwater basins, or look at desalination. Israel gets all of their water from desal, and we know desal works. It's expensive right now, but once we go mainline where it's it's all over um, the country, it becomes uh, much more affordable. And so I think there's some issues we need to look at to make this reality, but I want to do it. I don't want to be a politician forever. I want to go in, get the job done, and then frankly, come back home, and hopefully I'll be a grandma by then and and uh, be back in Arizona just enjoying life. Thank goodness for the rain last night, I guess, then. Great. I'm, one of my dogs only gets on the bed if it's a storm or rain. So she crawled up and then all of a sudden <laughs> I heard the rain and I was like, 
oh, now I know why you're here. My final question is around something that I think that you could speak to extremely well, given the fact that you're a woman, you know Donald Trump very well, and I think that the vote for him is the vote for you very much so. I think the women's vote is obviously something that is the biggest struggle, and it baffles me because here we are both very much supporting him, and I very much support you uh, as a strong, smart, and intelligent woman. So why is the woman, women's vote so hard? And what would you say to those women out there that are hesitant or have their guard up about him, whether it's personality or accusations? What would you tell them to try and convince them to not only vote for him, but, but you as well? I, I believe his policies are actually very pro-woman. When you look at um, just wanting to make sure that we have safe um, streets and secure streets, we know that he wants to, uh, he's a law and order kind of guy. I, I know as a woman, I want to feel safe when I walk across the grocery store parking lot. He wants to fund our police. The other side wants to defund our police. That doesn't make us safe. He wants to uh, keep the border and protect us when it comes to border crimes. You know, we've seen a lot of crimes against women uh, at the hands of people here illegally. President Trump is absolutely uh, wants to stop that type of crime and make sure that doesn't happen. He wants to protect girls' sports. My goodness, how many of us competed at some point in athletics? I didn't compete you know, professionally, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of a klutz a little bit, but I sure enjoyed competing. And I'm glad I didn't have to compete against men in athletics because that's just not a level playing field. And he wants to protect our girls um, from having to compete against men. He wants to protect our ability to speak out and to have freedom of speech. And I believe deeply that even if I disagree with someone, I want them to have the ability to speak freely. He wants to protect that First Amendment right for women. I know a lot of outspoken women who want to be able to speak their mind. I don't want anybody to be censored. And when it comes to, um, I think the issue they try to drive a wedge between us is on, on abortion. President Trump is not going to pass a national abortion ban. What I do believe he is going to do is work hard, and I want to help shepherd this as well, to put forth policy that does support women. I want to make sure that no woman is forced to make a decision like that based on just sheer economics, saying I can't afford to take care of a baby. If a woman is making a choice like that because of economics, because we're in such a bad economy, we got to turn that around. We want to make sure that if you want to keep your baby, there's help out there. And um, I believe he definitely wants to do that. You know, the left is trying to scare people. Right now, the choice on abortion is falling down to the state level where it should be. And the states are deciding what their laws are going to be. And we will respect those state laws but at the same time work to make sure women know there's support for them, both emotional, financial help, so that they're not making a decision where they wish they wouldn't have because they didn't think there was any help out there. Right. We need to be more pro-family and pro-woman as Republicans. And this new Republican Party, I believe, is the most pro-woman Republican Party of my lifetime. I want strong role models for my daughter and my son. And I think everybody out there wants to see strong role models. And I can't think of any stronger people than what's been assembled in this America First Party. So President Trump cares about women. He's raised several incredible young women from Tiffany uh, to Ivanka. I've gotten to know both of them. They're incredible, just an incredible family. And um I would just say that, and economically, he wants a strong economy. So if you want to start a business, if you want to uh, start investing, if you want to buy a house, you are going to have a much better chance as a woman under President Trump with his economic plan than under Kamala Harris that will have us just mired in scraping by week by week, barely um, getting through the week and the month with uh, the way things have become so unaffordable. Well, to make it clear for our people in Arizona, because I voted it's not it was not a vote for abortion on whether or not we allowed it or didn't allow it. It was a 15 week abortion ban up to 15 weeks or at any point. So even in this state itself, I know every state is up. It's up to the state itself. Um, it wasn't that we weren't that it wasn't allowed here. It was that there was a term that it was allowed versus not. So anyway, right. I think those are um, fantastic points. I love that you are doing this out of passion and you feel the calling and good luck. We'll see you in DC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you, I'm Karen. so glad that you're part of this movement. I welcome everyone. This movement is for all Americans. And I see our best, brightest days ahead. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the future. And God bless you, Danica. Thank you for being um, a great role model for uh, all of our all of our young people. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for your time. God bless you. 
Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.